has occurred since 2018 in the field of gambling, sex addiction, and in the field of addictions overall, particularly behavioral addictions that are seen as um, just pleasurable, okay? So let's talk about sex addiction, okay? That I'm, I'm going to recap some of the things in the book. I'm probably at the slide uh, in um, the PowerPoint that talks about sex addiction. And I'm gonna go between Dr. Robert Weiss's Addictions Old and New video that was about 40 minutes long. I'm gonna toggle between page 231 and I'm going to be at the sex addiction slide. Okay, so what do we think of when we think of sex addiction? Do we even think that it's a problem? That is one of the problems that I'm finding out that is occurring is that because it's a pleasurable activity, no one sees it as a problem. Although it's not formally in the DSM-5 um, in any type of way, uh, especially in the area of discrete psychiatric disorders, um, we as clinicians wanted to uh, look at uh, sex addiction and pornography addiction as hypersexual behavior or a hypersexual disorder. That is the clinical term for sexual uh, sex addiction. They did allow us in our field to even have that. But as he talked about in the video um, with Dr. Marty Koska and another gentleman, uh, he talked about uh, Dr. Eli Coleman. He's going to talk about those two gentlemen and how they saw sex addiction uh, differently. I'm going to uh, couple my lecture in intertwined porn um, pornography addiction in here and just kind of make it a little bit more broader in a sense. Uh, but sex addiction serious many of the features as <laughs> just like gambling addiction, just like shopping addiction, shares many of the features of substance use disorder. Uh, again, I'll remind you, we are looking at addiction on a continuum. That is like a line, a straight line. Where are you on that continuum? We're also looking at the defining elements of this disorder of hypersexual uh, disorder, which is the formal name of sex addiction. But people who are uh, who have displayed sex addiction behavior or addiction to pornography, they are uh, risk takers. They uh, are people who tend to have a very compartmentalized life. Most of the time, if they're addicted addicted to sex and or addicted to porn. It's segmented, meaning that um, you have many people, I, I know for me, I've worked with people over the years and who's, who've been addicted to um, sex addiction as well as pornography addiction. And one thing that's continuous is the impulsivity, but the compartmentalization. They hide their addiction well. Uh, they hide it from family. Um, since 2008, since 2018 uh, in the publishing of this edition of this book uh, the internet has taken off social media has taken off Instagram has taken off we have pages such as OnlyFans that a lot of people watch and in those uh, pages and things like that when we look at you know uh, those sites you know even though a lot of them have people who are on the platform of Patreon you know, where you can go and you can uh, watch them. What the people who are uh, the uh, influencers don't know, a lot of people are masturbating and uh, having sex, you know, to their videos. And one of the things that we have to realize is a lot of people, when we talk, particularly talk about pornography addiction, uh, what I've seen in my practice is a lot of people who are addicted to porn and they like to be watched as they uh, masturbate to porn. And in their, in their watching, they find ways to find people that they don't know to watch them. And they pay people to watch them. Uh, but one of the things that they also do is that they feel safe. They feel safe because they feel like they have the control. Uh, many of the people who are masturbating the porn and paying people to watch them as they masturbate uh, not only have impulse control behaviors, but most of the time they're masturbating to porn, they are not masturbating for pleasure. 
they're masturbating for release. Um, and they're using the masturbation to pornography as a way to manage the anxiety. Many of them are uh, high performing, uh, I've seen a lot of high performing accountants over the years. I've seen a lot of high performing, uh, not, not necessarily just attorneys, but people who have a lot of stress, uh, CEOs of companies, they're very stressed. And uh, of course we know the, the, the recommended cognitive therapy is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy. But one of the things that we have to look at when we look at hypersexual behavior, look at hypersexual behavior, we have to uh, just consider that, that pornography is a part of that. Um, and we have to just think of addiction on a continuum. You know, think of it as a, sp a spectrum. And again, how do we go, just like with gambling, how do we go from a pleasurable activity to an addiction is when our lives become unmanageable and we are no longer using that behavior um, in an adaptive way to bring us pleasure. We're using it in a maladaptive way, meaning that it is managing something within, uh, within us that is not resolved. Again, same pattern of behaviors. Um, people who struggle with gambling addiction um, and people who struggle with hypersexual disorder are also the ones who are um, sometimes genetic, genetically predispositioned, but they also have the behaviors, behavioral behavioral issues such as diagnoses such as ADHD, um, bipolar disorder, mood disorders. They, that is very common with people who are diagnosed with hyper, uh, it's not a diagnosis, but people who have hypersexual disorder, okay? When we look at what Dr. Weiss talked about in the old and, and um, new addictions, the neurobiological processes that he discussed, he talked about how, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> he talked about how uh, it's so synonymous with brain activity again it's so synonymous with gambling addiction eating disorders is all synonymous with the dopamine receptors i went over that in the previous video um the d2 dopamine receptors the limbic system the hippocampus gambling or alcoholism you know we don't look to save the person we're going to ask you know the person you know how they're doing with gambling um and um, alcohol issues or substance use disorder issues. I guess that's the best way to say that. But with gambling, sexual, uh, hypersexual disorder or hypersexual behavior, we don't ask them, how's your sex life going? How often are you having sex? Are you um, having sex with a consistent partner? Are you um, having sex for pleasure? You know. How are you gratifying yourself? We don't ask those questions in, in, in intakes out of embarrassment to people, but they need to be asked. Um, again, in my practice, I tend to ask those questions when people present more with impulse control behaviors, then I'll go in that direction. <clears throat> but we, um, we, whatever it is and whatever the absence is, we don't treat it like a priority for substance use. Um, we don't look at hypersexual behavior in that manner. And so what we do is we look at healthy sexuality is whatever the person has to find it to be. But healthy sexuality is healthy sexuality that is used for pleasure. When someone is anxious and they are masturbating, I'm probably going to talk about that a lot. I talk about it a lot in class when they are masturbating to porn to reduce anxiety that is where it becomes a maladaptive root cause of mind. Marty Costa, uh, which Dr. Wallace talked about, was the gentleman who introduced hypersexual, the hypersexual diagnosis to uh, the American Psychological Dis Association, as he said, and they denied it. And one of the reasons I like how he went out on a limb and talked about one of the reasons why they denied it is because if we accept it, then we have to accept that there's something wrong because we see we can only see um, sex through a monolith. We can't see sex, you know, in a broad, uh, on a spectrum. You know, people who are, um, who have sexual dysfunction or people who are, are 
addicted to sex or hypersexual or addicted to pornography um, who uh, chronically masturbate, you know, that has more to do with maladaptive behavior than we know. Um, when people are uh, masturbating like that throughout the day, they're trying to regulate emotions. And one of the reasons that Dr. Weiss talked about that uh, they, they, the APA rejected Marty Kaufman's uh, research is because um, they always tell us it's not enough research in the field. Um, one of the things in, uh, Dr. Ho talked about in the doctor videos of the doctor's TV show was that it was not enough robust research in the field. Part of that is the stigma. Who wants to talk about that they have a sexual dysfunction or that they masturbate or that they can't become erect in front of their spouse because they masturbated for four hours at work watching porn because their boss yelled at them, as he, as he said in the video. Um, when you spend all your money uh, on gambling, you know, that's not you know, a normal sexual behavior, meaning that if you spend all your money on gambling, okay, that's a problem. But when you spend all your money on sex, we don't like to see it as a problem. But maladaptive behavior, impulse control behavior, hypersexual behavior is hypersexual behavior, impulse control behavior. It is all the same. Um, and we have to look at it. When you can't keep your job, when you can't perform at work, uh, I know many people I've seen, um, they can't perform at work. If they, they have a, a major change at work, you know, and they start masturbating the porn, it is to regulate that stress and that anxiety. The reason Dr. Uh, Dr. Weiss talked about the significance of Dr. Kafka's research being in the historical perspective of hypersexuality is pretty much, is pretty much, is because it, um, it is, you know, it is the most research that we've had that's robust, robust that really put it out there as a problem. And so um, if you have a panel of people on the APA looking at this research and, you know, or a panel of people on any uh, platform looking at this research, they're going to start uh, internalizing and looking at themselves. And a lot of times we don't like to look at that. Um, we don't like to look at, you know, certain things as a problem. And people don't want to be labeled, uh, you know, uh, nymphomaniacs. They don't want to be labeled the Don Juan ism. Um, that, and then they went ahead in the research and they looked at uh, Dr. Patrick Kahn's research, and he looked at uh, the sex addiction of hypersexual disorder uh, from an addiction model, and he went to the OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, and behavior. And over time, you know, he changed his mind. He, he felt like uh, initially that um, hypersexual arousal or sex addiction was due to um, having uh, something in conjunction with OCD. And I think that's safe to say, but as they became um, more intrigued and people became more okay with being a part of research projects, Dr. Eli Coleman um, also had some research at the same time. And he talked about, um, it being on the OCD spectrum. But they came back and, uh, and reversed their, their, their findings that it's really on the spectrum of what Dr. Kafka talked about, of uh, hypersexual uh, disorder, more of a, an addiction perspective and an addiction model than, uh, and, than uh, on the old spectrum of OCD or, uh, or obsessive compulsive disorder. And so, you know, we had to look at uh, some other things. They looked at the parallels of other research of um, out of control sexual behavior. And uh, as you notice, we have a lot of different terms and nobody really wants to say sex addiction or hypersexual disorder, but out of control sexual behavior. Um, and I think a lot of times we don't want to admit that pleasurable sexual behavior can be uh, dysfunctional depending on how people are using it. We don't often look at sex as addiction as something that's always unpleasurable or doesn't bring us joy because it does. But how the person is using it to manage themselves is what we look at and that is where we determine where they are on the continuum of addiction. Again, there is not a diagnosis for hypersexual disorder. There is not anything diagnosable in the DSM-5. And, but so how do we treat that? For us as clinicians, we treat it on the, on the um, continuum of addiction. Um, 
a lot of people don't want to look at uh, is, is, is it because masturbating, you know, uncontrollably, they're trying to manage an anxiety disorder. Uh, and that's not necessarily always pleasure. They, they don't want to look at it like that. Um, we have to understand what ejaculation means for men and women. Everyone that's ejaculating is not always ejaculating to release pleasure. They're ejaculating a lot of times to release stress and anxiety. So highly pleasurable activities uh, such as excessive eating, gambling, or pornography, watching um, over a period of time of the addiction field, we have to look at what the person is demonstrating. And that's what he was talking about in the video. What behaviors are they demonstrating? Is it impulsivity, which it probably always is? And you look deeper into the impulsivity and where, what is the cause of the impulsivity? A lot of times there's a lot of shame associated with um, hypersexual disorder. A lot of times it's magnified, I've noticed, in uh, relationships with men and women in marriages. Shameful on both parts. Um, I've seen women who uh, need to masturbate uh, uncontrollably as well as men. Um, we have to do a lot of uh, cognitive uh, restructuring with them to help them understand that sex is uh, a physical, natural behavior. But sex is also something that we have to pay attention to how you're using it. And um, I've had to tell many uh, people in relationships, spouses, as well as people who are in long-term dating situations, if your husband is masturbating, um, multiple times a day that is not because of you if your wife is masturbating multiple times a day that is not because of something you like that has more something to do with something that's going on with that person um, a lot of times it's unresolved issues in their life particularly from pubescence as I said in adolescence that manifested into adulthood and this has become a coping skill of stress and a coping skill of anxiety and uh, they're just using a, a behavior that is pleasurable, that starts off pleasurable to manage depression, anxiety, and sometimes eating disorders. So I think once we take a look at looking at this differently, we'll be able to make some progress. On page 233, uh, again, and 232, the textbook is talking about the dopamine receptors in the brain. Uh, same thing we talked about with uh, gambling addiction. Uh, they did the textbook does talk about uh, our ex-president Bill Clinton and um, battling the allegations of multiple sexual transgressions um, and, and there was speculation that he may be a sex addict um, you know one of the things we don't like to put that information out there but it was in the textbook uh, but his behavior did not meet that criteria uh, in true in regards to true addiction Okay, um, same thing, you know, in, in contrast, uh, we can look at the New York representative, Anthony Weiner, and um, who spent, sent lewd photos of himself to young women. For this same reason, both men were able to function normally, successfully carry out their jobs, careers, but their behavior was not all consuming of their lives. And that's the one thing we have to look at. How consuming or all consuming is the behavior? Is the pleasurable behavior so consuming that we do, we have to consider addiction? You know, um, how much is it taking over your life? The people that I've seen is taking over their lives. They cannot get up without masturbating to pornography. Um, some people just get, you know, get to a place where they just masturbate on their own to release the anxiety and the pressures of the day. Again, remembering that addiction is a continuum. Same treatment that we talked about, uh, trying to inform CBT, uh, cognitive restructuring is what we're talking about. Um, they even try to, uh, in looking at the textbook of Tiger Woods, and I think he falls in the same continuum as Anthony Weiner and uh, President Bush, same category rather. Uh, I don't think it was all consuming of their lives. Um, when we look at the, the broader perspective of CBT, um, one of the things I, I would like to challenge researchers on is not just CBT and not just using MI, but looking at some of Marsha Linehan's work with dialectical behavioral therapy, I think that, um, and what I've done in my practice, emotional regulation, teaching interpersonal functioning, teaching that wise mind, those uh, skills that we use for people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, I see them being successful with treating sex addiction. I see them successful with treating um, 
hypersexual disorder. I see them successful with treating pornography addiction, with someone who excessively masturbates, um, because they're trying, they're all coming back and they're trying to regulate emotions. Um, the textbook uh, gives us, um, in, in the slides, a good perspective of um, CBT. Talks about the distortions again. But we have to teach the clients to avoid the black and white thinking. And then we have to ask about times when clients successfully handle the problem. Sometimes what we don't understand is the hypersexual behavior, the sex addiction, or um, addiction to pornography and or masturbating is because the person never handled the problem successfully. They always had a go-to and, the, and they never learned how to manage it. Uh, Cognitive restructuring is one of the things that the textbook talks about, uh, positive reframing, positive self-talk. But again, I challenge us to look at uh, some of that uh, DBT, the dialectical behavior therapy, that emotional regulation. Um, I think it would help uh, teaching people emotional regulation skills. Like when I, you know, I'm upset and I'm frustrated and I'm angry, I don't have to masturbate. I can manage my anger. I can feel the anger. And then I can have a list of things that I have to say to myself to manage my thoughts. Something like, um, cycles. You know, we do uh, sex, we do cycles with sex offenders. And I do like in the talk how Dr. Weiss talked about the difference between sexual offending and sexual addiction. And I do want to bring that part out before I go into cycles, because I use a lot of uh, cycles, and I use a lot of the cycles for um, that we use for people who are diagnosed with um, sexual offending behavior or CSC. But uh, when you look at cycles, it goes through, you know, what's your trigger event? Um, what's your hurtful fantasy? You know, what other behavior? What other behaviors do you have and do you display before you get to the actual act? And the act can be uh, physical, sexual, emotional, but it can be what is harming you. And that's why I like the cycle behaviors because as you look at how behavior cycles, you know, we're looking at how masturbation is harming you. Harming you from the pr perspective of you're not regulating your emotions. You're not regulating your thoughts. Um, but cognitive restructuring, that positive self-talk, that cognitive reframing um, directed toward the past and the present. And, and I, I would like to implement what we talk about at HUS 105, the injunctions, um, the life scripts. What did you hear? You know, I, I know many clients who um, have heard that they should masturbate and they've been told to masturbate instead of having sex when they entered the adolescent years. So they don't understand that masturbation, they're using it to regulate emotions. So it's a lot of different things here that we could talk about and that we need to talk about and that we need to discuss. Um, anger management programs is good, feeling good work, how do we manage anger and stress. Um, and understanding that as people age, they become more savvy. And what do we mean? We don't always have to go to drugs and alcohol for addiction, you know, to manage our addictions. We don't have to always go there. There are so many other options that are readily at our fingertips where people can um, have these dysfunctions and have this dysfunctional behavior and never touch drugs or alcohol throughout the day, especially people from working from home. Many people are working from home and they're masturbating in meetings. I mean, we don't talk about it, but they're not masturbating in meetings to the people that are in the meeting, they're, be, they're masturbating because they're anxious and they may be called on. They probably have their cameras off and they're home masturbating. I, I'm, I'm familiar with that from um, several clients. And they say it has to do with, you know, I'm, I have a fear of being put in front of everyone. So I'm trying to manage my emotions. So if I'm put in front of everyone, I can be um, ready to manage it and my stress level can decrease. So when we look at these things and we look at the textbook, you know, the next set of videos, they'll deal with, um, They'll do with bulimia and anorexia. But stress management and those cognitive distortions of all or nothing thinking, um, selective abstraction, and those ego defenses that we hear and we see projecting, um, fantasy, denial, you know, um, 
rejection, you know, regression, you know, all of those things, jumping to conclusions, overthinking, overgeneralizing, self-blaming, um, I must be perfect all the time. People are, you know, and, and those, um, con those uh, continuums, you know, they look at behavior is either right or wrong, left or right, good or bad, and there's no gray area in the middle. Everything is black and white. But looking at group exercises for feeling, feeling, you know, for facing different things, I think also one of the things that it's not enough research about is uh, grief and loss work. Trauma informed therapy does a good job with that, but I don't think they correlate enough of it to um, hypersexual behavior as well as addiction. They don't correlate enough of it to that. Uh, but uh, Dr. Robert Rice's videos, um, I've posted in the community section as well as I've uh, posted them in the. Um, discussion board, I'm sorry, not the discussion board, the content area of the site. Um, he has one about sex addiction is not about sex.